Hello. <clears throat> A little advice for uh, peace of mind and to ease our anxieties about life and the world and politics and whatever else you might be having to endure. Back to the first century, my friends. Okay, so peace of mind from the philosopher Seneca. He's talking to a, a disciple, a student, and this student is saying to him, when I look into myself, Seneca, some of my weaknesses I can see very well. I can see them so clearly I can almost touch them. Some others are hidden deep down, and some are neither on the surface or hidden or repressed, but they seem to sort of come and go, so to speak, depending on the circumstances. And I find these to be the most troublesome because I find myself neither at the ready, as if for war, but neither at ease, as in peace. So I find myself in this peevish and uh, quarrelsome state, not quite knowing what to do or which path to take. I mean, I find myself neither ill nor well. Now, please, don't tell me to try to exercise virtue and all that and to be patient and to practice and to keep trying. I know that practice brings about firmness because it becomes a habit. <clears throat> but you know, habit brings love of evil as well as love of good. And I think this is something like a sort of a mental illness or something that I have. I'm always wavering between two choices, it seems. Because my will does not incline strongly either to do the right thing or the wrong thing. So I hope, I'm talking to you as a doctor, as if I was speaking to a doctor, I hope you can find the solution to this malady of mine. I'll give you an example, he says. His name is Serenus, the student. He says, I'll give you an example. I am rather frugal in my life. I'm not ostentatious or anything like that. I don't like expensive clothes, for example. My clothes are homely, comfortable, no, no brand names. I don't care for all that. In food, I'm not particularly bothered about not eating caviar or oysters. It doesn't worry me a bit. I'm quite happy with ordinary, humble, fresh food. That's fine for me. But here's the thing, if I'm invited, when I'm invited to someone's home, a lavish home, an expensive home, beautiful, expansive gardens, pools, and when we're all there on a wonderful summer evening, sipping nice cold wine, and the house is absolutely beautiful, gorgeous furniture, big rooms, I mean, when I find myself surrounded by luxury, having been frugal for so long, which I was rather proud of, you know, I, I can't help thinking, hmm, this, this, is, <laughs> this is not bad, could get used to this, no problem. So when I come back home to my little frugal place here, I'm not happier for living like this as I was, I'm actually rather sad. I don't seem to walk about with my head high, proud of my trivial possessions anymore. There's always sort of a knowing doubt that tells me, mm, perhaps you're not doing very well in life after all, are you? Another example. I want to stand for office, for public office, in politics. Not, not because of the purple robe I am to wear, you know, and all the goodies and the perks and the admiration and that comes with it. No, not the purple, but honestly, to serve my fellow citizens. But then when things go badly, I just 
want to give up and run home and convince myself that it is better not to seek other people's approval and concentrate on my own peace of mind, reading, my own leisure, it's really not worth all these problems. To cut the matter short, I think this is a weakness, this uncertainty that I have. And I'm telling you about it because I think it's getting worse, which worries me. Or worse still, that I am hanging on an edge, like someone always on the point of falling, and that perhaps there are more wrong things with me than I care to admit to myself. Perhaps I'm suffering from not knowing myself well enough. I am asking you because I happen to think that many people would have acquired wisdom if they had not imagined that they already had it. I mean, who dares to tell himself the whole truth to himself? So, if you have Seneca, if you have any cure for this, please advise me. I know that these doubts on my mind are not dangerous. They will not produce a storm, but, but, you know, not a storm, but a sort of a seasickness, rather. So whatever you think my illness here is, please help me to root it out. Okay, so this is his concern. And Seneca says, You're not the only one, believe me. <laughs> I have often asked myself what I should compare this state of mind with, always vacillating between right and wrong, and perhaps I can better explain it by way of analogy. This is similar to the condition of people who have got over a long serious illness, but are still mildly affected by onsets of some fever or pain. And even when they're totally cured, these people are still worried and upset, and though cured, keep visiting the doctor and worrying just in case, and complain if they feel hot. Or... With people like this, it is not that their bodies are sick, but that they are insufficiently used to being healthy. Look. You need no radical remedies for this. Blocking yourself here, being angry with yourself there, but the final treatment, and it is this. Confidence in yourself and the belief that you are on the right path and not led astray, uh, uh, astray by the many tracks you come across, followed by people who are hopelessly lost, though some are wandering not far off the right path. The Greeks call this euthymia, let's call it tranquility. Our mind uh, wants to seek a smooth and steady course, well, be well disposed to itself, happy in its condition, a state of peace with no ups and downs all the time. So, all right, so how can we achieve this? Well, to begin with, there are people who are afflicted with too much fickleness or boredom, a ceaseless change of purpose, and always yearning for what they have left behind. And there are those who just yawn out of apathy. There are those too who toss around like insomniacs and keep changing their position and their goals until they finally find rest out of sheer weariness. They keep altering the condition of their lives and eventually unfortunately stick to that one in which they are trapped, not by weariness of further change but by that state of old age which is too sluggish to try something new. There are those also who suffer from inertia and so lack the courage to live as they would wish, and so they keep living as they had always lived. So, there are numberless characteristics of this malady, but the outcome is the same dissatisfaction with oneself. This is due to the mind not being stable enough from 
fearful and that comes from fearful and unfulfilled desires when men do not dare or do not achieve all they long for and all they can grasp for is hope it's like living in suspense they want to follow on the right path they chose the the they 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 want to follow the right path but they chose the wrong one and so when their effort is unrewarded this fruitless failure tortures them and end up regretting not that they went the wrong way but the frustration of their desires and then they are gripped by feeling sorry for having attempted it and fear of trying again and so they undermine themselves by a restless mind that finds no outlet because they can neither control nor obey their desires by the dithering of a life that cannot see its way ahead and by the lethargy of a soul stagnating amid its abandoned hopes and then we have melancholy and tiredness of life and the thousand doubts of a wavering mind aroused by the birth of hope but brought down by the death of it and since unproductive idleness, idleness nurtures malice and because they themselves cannot prosper they want everyone else to be ruined and from this comes dislike of other people's success and despair of their own and their minds become enraged against fortune complain about the times retreat into obscurity and brood over their own sufferings until they become sick and tired of themselves this is not healthy for the human mind is agile and always requires activity you know there are certain bodily sores which welcome the hands that hurt them a foul itch loves to be scratched likewise those minds whose desires have broken out like horrid sores they delight it seems in toil and aggravation and so some opt to distract themselves they travel into foreign shores they make one journey after another change spectac spectacle for another spectacle but to what end as lucretius said thus each man ever flees himself but what is the point to flee into other places if you cannot escape from yourself these people keep changing their aims. They cannot put up with toil or pleasure or themselves for long. And this weakness has driven men to their deaths because by frequently changing their aims, they keep falling back on the same things and leaving themselves no room for novelty and ask, how long must I face the same thing? Look, you mentioned contributing to your country, to your community, and you failed in becoming, let us say, prime minister or being elected to parliament. All right. Why do you imagine you're no, you're no good at serving your community if that is what you honestly desire? There are other ways. Match your goals to your capabilities. Service to your country is not only becoming Prime Minister or Member of Parliament or defending people in court. The man who teaches the young, for instance, and we have a shortage of good teachers, and this is the first century AD. <laughs> um, the one who teaches the young, for instance, uh, one who grips and restrains those who are rushing madly after wealth and luxury, he too is doing public service. Look, the man defending his country is not just the soldier on the front line defending the right and the left wings, but also the one who guards the city gates and has the post, less dangerous, yes, but not idle, of keeping the watch and guarding the armaments. 
these duties too, though bloodless, count as military service. If you apply yourself to study, you will avoid all boredom of, with life, and you will, you will not long, you will not long for the night, because you are sick of daylight. You will not long for the night because you are sick of daylight. You will be neither a burden to yourself or useless to others. You will attract many to become your friends and fine people will flock about you. Even obscure virtue is never concealed but gives clear evidence of herself. But if after failure we shun all society and abandon the human race and live for ourselves alone, we might be squandering the time which nature gave us to be used. Some of us use it sparingly, others wastefully, some spend it so that they can give a proper account of it, yet others so that we have so that they have no balance left in the account, a most shameful result. Some people have no further proof of their life than their age. Actually, Leonardo da Vinci said this too in a different way. He said rather mockingly the only way you can tell that some people have been here on earth is because of the urinals they have left behind. <laughs> oh dear. I have often asked myself, what will I leave? Um, my daughters? What else? Oh dear. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> oh dear. Hopefully more than a urinal. urinal. <laughs> okay, so going back to Seneca. So yes, we have to yield sometimes, but by a gradual retreat, holding on to our standards and soldiers' honor. In the failure of battle, those soldiers who are still armed when they agree terms with the enemy are safer and more highly rewarded. If Lady Fortune gets the better of someone and deprives him of the means of action, he should not immediately turn his back and bolt, dropping his weapons and looking for a place to hide, as if there was a place where Fortune could not find you. But he should apply himself more sparingly to his duties and choose something carefully in which he can serve the state. Suppose you cannot be a soldier. Well, seek public office. Suppose you have to live in a private capacity. Well, become an advocate. Suppose you are condemned to silence. Help your fellow citizens by unspoken support. Suppose you wanted to join the army, but only if you could be a general. That's not going to work for a lot of us. And even if others hold the front line, and your lot has put you in the third rank, you must play the soldier there with your voice and your encouragement, your example and your spirit. Even if a man's hands are cut off, he finds he can help his side by standing firm and cheering them on. What I'm saying is this. If fortune has removed you from a leading role in public life, you should still stand firm and cheer others on. And if someone grips your throat, still stand firm and help, though silent. The service of a good citizen is never useless. Being heard and seen, even a nod of your head, a stab and silence, even your gait, sometimes helps. Just as certain wholesome substances do us good simply by their fragrance alone, without tasting or touching them, so virtue spreads her advantage even from a distant hiding place, and this whether she walks forward about her legitimate business or appears on sufferance and is forced to furl her sails. 
whether she is confined or inactive or mute within a narrow space or fully visible in any condition at all she does good service therefore according to the liberty that fortune allows us we shall either extend or contract our activities but at all events we must stir ourselves up and not be gripped and paralyzed by fear he is a man he will prove himself to be a man when threatened by danger on all sides with weapons and chains clattering around him will neither endanger nor conceal his courage self-preservation does not mean suppressing yourself then tattoos then tattoos is that philosopher i told you about once it's a, it was a nickname uh, he was supposed to have been born with teeth already so they call him from dente teeth they call him then tattoos like toothy or something <laughs> okay so then tattoos used to say that he preferred real death to living death because the ultimate horror is to die before you die but if you happen to live at a time when public life is hard to cope with do not give up you might have to seek a safe har harbor for a while as if you were on a dangerous voyage but temporarily to refresh your soul then come back and further this is important we need to appraise ourselves of what we are capable we usually overestimate our capabilities one man comes to grief through trusting his eloquence another makes more demands on his fortune than he can stand another taxes his frail body with laborious work some men are too shy for politics which require a bold appearance and some are too brash and not fitted for court life some cannot restrain their anger and any feeling of annoyance drives them to reckless language for all these retirement for a while in solitude sometimes is more expedient than public activity a passionate and impatient nature must avoid provocations to outspokenness that will cause trouble then we must appraise the actual things we are attempting and match our strength to what we are going to undertake because the performer the doer must always be stronger than his task loads that are too heavy for the bearer are bound to overwhelm him you must consider whether your nature is more suited to practical activity or to quiet study and reflection and incline in the direction your natural faculty and disposition takes you it might be better if you leave parliament and if you're not if you're not for public office it will be better to for you to leave parliament and go off and write history somewhere somewhere <laughs> about right history okay more surround yourself with people who value you nothing delights the mind so much as as a as fond and loyal friendship what a blessing it is to have hearts that are ready and willing to receive all your secrets in safety with whom you are less afraid to share knowledge of something than to keep it to yourself whose conversation soothes your distress whose advice helps you make up your mind whose cheerfulness dissolves your sorrows whose very appearance cheers you up choose them carefully avoid being damaged by close contact with those who do not wish you well 
just as during an epidemic disease we must take care not to sit beside people who are infected with a feverish disease because we shall put ourselves at risk and suffer from their breathing upon us so in choosing our friends for their characters we shall take care to find those who are less corrupted let us now look at private possessions, the greatest source of human misery. If you compare all the things from which we suffer, deaths, illnesses, fears, desires, endurance of pains and toils, if you compare all these with the evils that money brings, you will find that money far outweighs the others. The pain of not having money, believe it or not, is lighter than the fear of losing it. Seneca, he, 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 he writes about this uh, a lot, but he's not actually romanticizing poverty. He's saying, oh, don't worry, you're poor, you have nothing to eat, but the rich also suffer. That is not going to help. He, he, he's not saying that. He's going to explain it. He, he's, um, okay, because I'm going to, okay. Look, um, what, I, what I'm trying to say is this. Um, by romanticizing poverty, I mean, for example, you know, with uh, the works of uh, Charles Dickens in the 19th century, yes, who exposed expose poverty and of course the uh, the the middle the the, the upper classes um, oh dear you know reacted in you know with the best of intentions reacted oh my dear so people actually live like this so let's get together a few crumbs and give it to them best intentions not not a problem with that but they rather romanticize poverty there is nothing romantic about poverty you want to get out of it as soon as you can but this is not Seneca's point. He says, and I'm going to, because I have been sort of saying what he says in more or less my own words, except when they are uh, that beautiful passage about friendship. Obviously, that's not me. But this is what he says. The less poverty has to lose, the less agony it will cause us. You are mistaken if you think that rich people suffer with more fortitude. The pain of a wound is the same in a large or a small body. Bion, Bion was a 3rd century BC. Um, he was a comedian. He was um, not a comedian, a wit. Yeah, He was known for his wit. Bion used to say that the act of Plucking out one hair from your head hurts a person who is balding as much as one with a full head of hair. Okay, that's the... Okay, you can make the same point that rich and poor suffer equal distress. For both groups cling to their money and suffer if it is torn away from them. But, and here comes his point, it is easier to bear, it is simpler not to be in a position to acquire things than to lose what you have. So it is easier for people whom fortune did not favor to be, for these people to be more cheerful than to those whom fortune has deserted. But perhaps you have become involved in some difficult situation in life in which either public or private circumstances have fastened a noose on you, unawares. A noose which you can neither loosen or snap. Reflect that prisoners in chains only at first feel the weight of the shackles on their legs. In time, if only for self-preservation, they have decided not to struggle against them, but to bear them. In other words, 
from necessity they have learned to endure with fortitude and from habit to endure with ease. In any situation in life you will find delights and relaxations and pleasures if you can bring yourself to make light of your troubles and not to let them, as far as you're capable, not to let them distress you unbearably. Perhaps a sense of humor. <laughs> Nature knows to what sorrows we were born and so she contrived habit to soothe our disasters and quickly make us grow used to the worst ills. No one could endure lasting adversity if it continued to have the same force as when it first hit us. We are all tied to fortune, by some by a loose and golden chain and others by a tighter one and of poor metal. And what does it matter? We are all held in the same captivity. One man is bound by high office, another by wealth. Good birth weighs some people down and humble origins weigh heavily on others. Some bow under the rule of other men and some under their own. Some are restricted to one place by exile, others by their office. You have to get used to your own circumstances, complain about them as little as possible, and grasp whatever advantage they have to offer. No condition is so bitter that a sound and stable mind cannot find an opportunity in it. Think your way through difficulties. Harsh conditions can be softened, Restricted ones can be widened, and heavy ones can weigh less on those who know how to bear them. We must not send our desires and our hopes and goals and objectives on a distant hunt, but allow them to explore what is near at hand. Abandoning those things which are impossible or difficult to attain, let us pursue what is readily available and entices our hopes. And let us not envy those who stand higher than we do, what look like towering heights to you may well be precipices to them. Yeah, there is another saying, they look like giants only because you are on your knees. On the other hand, those whom an unfair fate has put in a critical condition will be safer if they can lower their pride in things that are themselves proud and reducing their fortune as far as they can to a more humble level. You know, there are many up in the summit who wouldn't mind exchanging places with you at times because they are forced to cling to the pinnacle where they are, sometimes with their fingernails, because they cannot descend without falling. But all this applies to people like you and me who are imperfect, commonplace and unsound, but not to the wise man. A wise man does not have to walk nervously or cautiously, for he has such confidence that he does not hesitate to make a stand against fortune and will never give ground to her. He has no reason to fear her, and I'll tell you why because he regards as having on loan not only his goods and possessions but even his body, his eyes and his hands, his very self, on loan. And he lives as if he were on loan to himself and bound to return that loan on demand without complaint. 
and he is not cheap in his own eyes because he knows he is not his own but he will act in all things as carefully and meticulously as a devout and holy man guards anything entrusted to him and whenever he is ordered to repay his debt he will not complain to fortune but he will say i thank you for what i have possessed and held i have looked after your property to my great benefit but at your command i yield and give back with gratitude and good will what is yours if you still want me to keep anything of yours i shall keep it safe if you want otherwise i give it back and restore to you my silver both coined and plate my house my household should god demand back what he has previously entrusted to us we shall tell him take back my spirit in better shape than when you gave it to me i do not quibble or hang back i am willing for you to have right now what you gave me before i was conscious take it and what is the harm of returning to the place whence you came this is all seneca for you just some advice <laughs> thank you for listening and uh, please like and uh, do all that kind of thing at the end thank you so much bye bye